I want to welcome up our speaker today. He needs no introduction. He's a great man, a patterned son. Uh, we love him very much. Let's welcome up Pastor Joseph Sevier. Thank you, Big Daddy. Well, it's good to be in the house of God this morning. Man, I miss worshiping with our church. Been trying to work like a grown man. Step up my game. Gotta take care of this amazing wife right here. But you know, pastors right now, Benjamin and Sonny, are in South Korea, and they just had a powerful conference with New Philly. And I just want to take a moment and pray for them. You know, every time they go out and minister, they come back refreshed and on fire and excited, and it's great to hear the things that God's doing. And as Pastor Benjamin shared, you know, this is a body movement, so it's not just them being in South Korea. We've been in South Korea, and when God has invested in them, as our sister shared, that mutual sharing um, is also not just for them, but it's for us. And man, so I'm excited because when they come back, they're about to give us some stuff, and it's going to be good, right? Let's just pray for them right now. Father, we thank you for our pastors. God, we speak blessing over Benjamin and Sonny, God. We thank you that you have given them to us as a gift, and you've given them to this body of Christ, Lord, all over the world as a gift, Father. And Lord, we cherish them, and with their daughter, Aletheia, God, and we just declare our pastors are blessed. And Lord, we pray that every word that they have spoken, every seed that they have sown in the ministry, Lord God, over in South Korea, everything that they've invested into New Philly, and also that's been imparted into them, God, we pray that those seeds will begin to flourish, God and that your body would expand because of it, we declare in the name of Jesus that they're going to come back strong. They're going to come back encouraged. They're going to come back, Lord, full, not depleted in any way. And, Lord, we thank you that you're expanding us as you're expanding them. And we thank you for them. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, um, we're going to get it today, y'all. You ready for this? Man, this season of my life is called The Grind. Look to your neighbor and say, The Grind. I just uh, I got home last night about 2.45 a.m. from work, got my butt up as my wife helped me, and, uh, she, you know, she did my clothes, she picked, you know, she's good, that girl good, and uh, ironed it for me, and I got to preach next service, which I'm super excited about, and I go back to work at 3 o'clock. It's going to be good. So look to your neighbor, say the grind. Whew, yeah. This vocation series. You know, I'm honored to be able to speak about, speak during this time, during this vocation series. And not only am I honored and excited to be speaking during this season, but I have been so refreshed and encouraged from Pastor Benjamin's last three messages. As he's been talking about really the heart and the root of what God is doing in our lives and in our church as we're talking about this vocation series. You know, the first week he talked about Ananias and Sapphira and looking at the heart that God is really looking for. The agenda of the Holy Spirit, which is selflessness in the body of Christ. Look to your neighbor and say, selflessness. selflessness. Now, don't get this mixed up with meaning you can't pursue your dreams, or you can't pursue your passions, or you can't be great at what you do. But what he was talking about is how God is getting to the heart. He's getting to the core of what it's about in us. And it's about a life fully surrendered, modeled after Christ, who made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, becoming nothing and making himself obedient to death, even death on a cross. And it was at that place of selflessness that the Father exalted him and gave him the name above all names. And the Holy Spirit's agenda in the body of Christ is to infuse in us that same heart of selflessness. And at that point, at that place, we're poised and we're ready to begin to carry out the purpose of God in our lives. And that was the first week. So if you didn't hear that message, y'all go get it, meditate on that, bump it in your car, put it on your iPad, do what you got to do, but get that junk, all right? The second week. He talked about rising up in our authority and not surrendering the authority that God has given us. And we looked at the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28 when Jesus said, All authority in heaven on earth has been given unto me. And he didn't say, it, he didn't say it's just been given unto me, cool, let's throw a party. He said, All authority in heaven on earth has been given unto me. Therefore, as a result of all authority being given to me, you go into the world and make disciples baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son of the Holy Spirit. And he looked at that word baptism as not just a water baptism, like being dunked in the water, you know what I'm saying? Uh -uh, right? But as in immersing them into the name of the Father and Son of the Holy Spirit, immersing them into the presence of God. So the authority that God has given us is not without power, but it's also not without purpose. God has given us authority to carry out the Great Commission. And something that he said that was so powerful and resonated with me was this. He said, God has placed us where he has for a reason. That every place that you have been positioned in your life 
in your job, in your family, in your city, is to fulfill the Great Commission. And you've been given all authority through the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. And so we followed up in week number three. So if you didn't get that second week, y'all go listen to it, bump that junk, get it. All right. Week three was this. We were looking at Acts chapter one, verse eight, when he talked about seeking the power of the Holy Spirit. And we said the power, he said, wait in Jerusalem. And he says that the Spirit of God will be poured out upon you. You will receive power when the Spirit comes upon you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And Pastor Benjamin emphasized that the Spirit of God is literally God's very presence among us. But it's not without purpose. When God pours out his spirit, he pours out his spirit for a reason. And again, it's piggybacking on the reason is fulfilling the Great Commission, being witnesses in the world. And a witness is someone that testifies or shares about what they've seen, what they've heard, what they've experienced. And he shares that we've been given the power of the Holy Spirit, not just to be like, yay, God. And not just to be like, dude, that was dope. Or you had service last Sunday, dude, God's spirit fell, prophesied, people laid out, got healed. It was awesome. But he's saying God pours out his spirit so that you can take it. And when God places you where he's placed you for a reason, that your life now becomes a witness to the power of God there. Every place that God places you is a kingdom place. Because the kingdom of God is within you. The power of God is within you. So every place that you have been placed, every place that you set your foot, no matter where you step, I don't care if that's in the hood or if that's in the suburb. I don't care if that's in your office or if that's on the street. Every place you set your foot is a kingdom place. It's a place that's potent with the potential for the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. And that's how we have to see it. And he said, we're not just meant to seek the power and the presence of God for no reason. Right? And he shared about the revival that was breaking out in Argentina. And Pastor Pablo De Rose said how one guy came up to the altar, and as the Holy Spirit is falling, he begins to cry. He's like, I want more of God. I want more of God. I want more of God. And he shares a story how Pastor Pablo looked at him and said, why? Why do you want more of the power of the Holy Spirit? Right? Rhetorical question. So you can be religious? So you can say you met with God? So you can say you had an awesome time at church and then go outside and cuss out somebody out on Monday at work, right? Why do you want more of the power of God? So that way you could be cool and you could post on Facebook, dude, I got rocked by God. And the dude's like, well, I just want more. And he said, you know what, go and sit back down. Until you're ready for this power to be so released in your life that now it's overflowing when you walk out the four walls of this church, you're not yet ready. And Pastor Benjamin was sharing about how God wants to empower us through the spirit to move us into the place. So that way, when we're placed where he puts us for a reason, the Great Commission now just becomes a part of our lives. Yeah. And as we're looking at our vocation, we're going to look at how you were placed in that place with the presence of God to be witnesses into the world. But the question is, are you operating that way? Look to your neighbor and say, you down with this? So we're going to look at a story in the Bible. Y'all like stories? I just love my papa read me stories before I go to bed at night. And one of this story that we're going to look at is one of my favorite characters in the whole Bible. It's the story of Joseph. I mean, he just must be a good guy, right? He got a good name. I'm not just saying that because my name's Joseph, but uh, I mean, this, this dude, he's legit, all right? So we're talking, we're piggybacking on that concept of the power of God is residing in us. And so the first thing we're going to talk about today is that we're established or the presence and power of God is in us to prosper through the stewardship that God gives us. And so we're going to look at this in the life of, jo life of Joseph. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 39, verse 1 through 6. So it says, now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. So this is after he's been sold into slavery. This is after he's had the awesome dream. Oh, what's up, guys? This is after he's got the coat of many colors. It's after his major betrayal by his brothers. It's after he had these high hopes and was doing extremely well in his father's household. And his dad was teaching him how to work hard. His dad was teaching him how to be responsible. Right? His dad was teaching him all these great things and setting him up for success. And then all of a sudden, the carpet got pulled out from under him. This dude fell flat on his face, and he's thrown into a pit, left to die for a moment. And then his brother's like, shh. 
You can't be that bad, you know what I'm saying? He is our brother, so let's at least sell him into slavery, you know, and just act like he died. That would be cool. That would be jacked up, huh, bro? I got my brothers. My brothers, there's nine of us. I'm sure they want to do that to me sometimes, you know? I was, I was the crybaby of the family for a little while, but now I'm a grown man, you know what I'm saying? Passing behind me, shoot. You know, kung fu, you know what I'm feeling? All right, so Joseph is going through all of this, and now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. And he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw the Lord was with him and that the Lord God gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. Dude, that's legit. Look to your neighbor and say, that's legit. legit. From the time he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. God blessed Potiphar because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food that he ate. Now, I want you to get something for a moment real quick. Here is a slave sold into a foreign country. He didn't know the Egyptian's language. All he knew was the Hebraic language. He's going into a place where he knew nothing about. I mean, first of all, have you ever been in a spot where you don't speak the same language as other people? Right? So, I mean, I'm Mexican, right? But not the real kind of Mexican. I'm kind of like the... They kind of Mexican, let's just be real, right? Like, I'm trying to be, but no, I'm born in America, you know what I'm saying? So, and part French, though, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you got to hold that in there. Um, but I'm working in the kitchen and going through my training, and I'm working, and there's a lot of Hispanic people in our kitchen, right? And they're talking, and I can't understand a word that they're saying. And it's horrible, because I'm supposed to be a manager, and they're supposed to be training me, and I don't speak the same language. And it's just, I cannot tell you, I felt like a little kid. Here I am, a grown man. And I'm going to be managing and leading these, these team members. And I feel like, dude, like, I'm stupid, right? I mean, I'm not really stupid. I'm a, I'm a smart man. <laughs> Got to establish this. <laughs> but I felt stupid at times. I felt like a child. I felt ignorant, right? I was taken out of the familiar, and I was taken out what I've known and what I was comfortable with. I mean, I grew up here at Living Hope. Right? Texas Roadhouse is the, the, the second place that I worked. First place I ever worked was Living Hope Christian Center. Then I worked at Texas Roadhouse. I only had two jobs. I'm saying, grown man, consistent. You feel me? I'm loyal, baby. That's how I roll, right? And so, 10 years in this familiar context, and now I'm going to work in the restaurant industry. And first of all, they're talking about business stuff that I have no understanding about. And I'm like, dude, I did ministry stuff, and business stuff is a little different. And now I'm going and trying to work in the kitchen and learning everything because I got to learn every position. And they're speaking Spanish, and they're trying to show me. And, and I just imagine Joseph getting taken out of this comfortable, familiar environment where he had favor and where he was looked upon successfully and where his father looked at him and was just like, oh, I love you. And now it, people are looking at him like, dude, you're a slave. And matter of fact, he wasn't even an equal. I mean, the culture was so that Joseph, as a Hebrew, couldn't even sit in the same table with an Egyptian and eat food. And so he went from being this favored son, lavish with this coat of many colors, fluent in what he's doing, proficient in his skill, as a shepherd, having a secure future to Dude, I feel like a kid. I don't know what the heck is going on around me. And I'm looked at as someone that's not even equal to the people around me. Have you ever grasped that concept and just thought about Joseph and what he must have felt? But now, we see in Joseph, we see in this passage that for some, somehow, Joseph began to rise. And the first component of it was that the power of God was with them. How do I know the power of God was with them? Because the scripture says the Lord was with him. And in Acts 1.8, when he says, "All you'll be given power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, is what? You're going to get power, the power of God because his little, pre- little presence is going to be inside of you. So the presence of God was so strongly in Joseph 
that even his natural inabilities to be proficient at the Egyptian language or within the culture or the different tasks that he was doing, Lord, it caused him to begin to have this drive and this hunger to begin to succeed. The power of God didn't allow him to remain at the low level of inadequacy of what he probably felt. Because the presence of God was so strongly in him, something must have been inside of him and said, I can't just remain here. Because guess what? Just because God's presence with, is with you doesn't mean you're going to be the best at everything that you do. Right. So it wasn't just Joseph walking into Potiphar's house like, shoot, God's presence is with me. You know what I'm saying? Put me at the top of the food chain, baby. <laughs> he must have started from the bottom, and now he was on top. But it didn't just happen overnight. You better believe that Joseph entrusted himself to study. I imagine Joseph being in there at night with a little candle looking over the, the hieroglyphics and looking at everything that he had to do to study and make himself great. Amen. You think Potiphar was going to take someone who wasn't even considered an equal and elevate him to the place of equality with himself and entrust everything in his care to Joseph? I mean, that's like your CEO coming in on the first day of your job and saying, you know what? Hey, I know you just got hired on, but you look cool. I'm going to give you all my responsibilities, okay? All I'm going to do is come in. Make sure everything's going good, and I'm going to leave. I mean, would any of you guys think that's realistic? Sometimes we read the scripture, and we're like, oh, dude, God was with them, so that must have happened with Joseph. No, you've got to read in between the lines here. He busted his butt. He worked hard. He had 15, 16, 20-hour days maybe. He was probably working in the fields during the day as a slave and then going at home and saying, dude, give me some papers to read. Give me something. I, I'm not going to stay here at this low level. I'm going to rise. And we see that the presence of God caused Joseph to prosper. And when I think about Joseph, I look, I think about the psalmist or Moses in Psalms chapter 90, verse 17, where it says, May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. I imagine Joseph that burning in his heart, and even though Moses lived after Joseph, I imagine that being in Joseph's heart, God established the work of my hands. As I was entrusted as a shepherd in my, father, in my father's household, as I rose among my brothers, not because I thought I was better than them, because I applied myself, God established the work of my hands here in Egypt. I'm not going to remain where I'm at, God. Man, you put too much inside of me. You're too great of a God. Man, you took Abraham out of Babylon. That's where you called Abraham, God. And now my father, Jacob, you brought him here. And now he's risen as a prince among all the people. God, I'm Joseph. I'm not meant to stay at this low level. But he didn't just sit there and say, God, do something about it. He applied himself. He put his hands to work. And as a result, he became a steward through the power of God, empowering him to be able to do it. And so we see that Joseph applied himself to the work that was set before him, no matter what it was. Can I tell you something? I'm about to tell it. That's right, bro. I'm about to get it. <laughs> there is no such thing as a menial job in the kingdom of God. Yeah. Y'all got to get this. Because some of you at work like, I'm too good for this. <laughs> I was talking to a girl yesterday, and she really wants to be promoted, right? And she's, she's a legit worker. Um, and she's solid. But there's other people in line. Because everybody's busting their butt. Everybody wants to move up. And she, uh, she kind of started crying. And I kind of pulled out my heartstring, right? <laughs> it's cool, girl. Cry, man. I'm here for you. And um, she was like, I just, I just think I'm too good for what I'm doing right now. And at that moment, I was like, <laughs> put my tears back in my eyes, <laughs> put my heart string back up. And part of me wanted to be like, girl, you tripping. You ain't never too good for nothing. It's like Martin Luther King Jr. said, man, if you're going to be a janitor, you'll be the best stinking janitor in the world. It doesn't matter what position you're in. It doesn't matter how talented or skilled you think you are. No matter where you're at, God's placed you there for a purpose, and there's nothing menial in the kingdom. Yeah. If you're there, you're there for a reason. And as long as you're there, you better be great at what you do. Amen. Because if God is living in you, and if the power of the Holy Spirit is in you, there's no reason that you should just be satisfied with mediocre living, and there's no reason that your boss should look at you and be like, why aren't you moving up? You should be chomping at the bit and him saying, dude, I can't, I can't hold this person down enough. Yeah. He should be taming lions, not prodding turtles. Right. Y'all feel me? Yeah. So Joseph looked at everything that he did as kingdom work, as a work of God. 
I mean, I imagine him out on the fields, dude, I'm going to get this junk. I imagine him picking up waters, cisterns of water, and then being heavy, because back in Egypt, it was like that big old cistern out of clay. That junk was heavy, you know. It wasn't those little plastic stuff that we'd be carrying around, right? And no little canteen over there. That boy was uh, shoveling manure. Some of us be like, Shh, manure. You just got my nails, dude, you feel me? <laughs> Joe's like, bring it. Whatever you give me, I'm going to be great at it. And so what he did was he realized that he was going to entrust God with the results and he was going to apply himself fully to the responsibility that was before him. He was going to entrust the results to God as he applied himself fully to the task that was given him. He said, give me any task that you want. Give me any job, any vocation. Put me in any position. I know who my God's called me to be. I'm going to be great at what it is that I do, and you're going to recognize it. And look at this. I mean, the Bible says that Potiphar was able to see that his God was with him. I mean, that's pretty crazy. First of all, Potiphar didn't believe in the God of Israel. He believed in a bunch of fake gods. But Joseph's life and his witness was so powerful through his work. His day-to-day job And the effectiveness that he had on his day-to-day job was so powerful that Potiphar was like, dude, his God must be real. And his God is with him. And not only is his God with him, but his God has given him favor. And everything that this boy touches his hand to is great. My question to you this morning is when you walk into your workplace, does your boss, does your overseer, do your coworkers say, dang, God is with them? Now, I'm not just talking about because you got the Christian bumper sticker when you're rolling into work, you know what I'm saying? It's like, Jesus is coming, you better repent, or you're going to hell with gasoline jaws on it. <laughs> I'm not talking about because you play Christian music at the desk like people you always be talking about. I'm not talking about because you wear Jesus t-shirts or you grab your Bible and you put it on top of your desk. Hey, y'all, see my Bible? Don't be touching it. My Bible. I'm talking about your ethic. I'm talking about your integrity. I'm talking about the words that come out of your mouth. I'm talking about your character. I'm talking about are you on time to work? I'm talking about are you waiting at the punching spot for the clock to hit that 12 so as soon as that second hits, you're gone. And like, ain't my responsibility, I'm off the clock. Or are you there, hey, is there anything else I could do for you, sir, before you bounce or before I leave? You need anything else, any extra work? It's cool, it's an extra five minutes. I don't need to be on the clock for it. I'll take care of it. I'm talking about that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, something I love is when I walk into work and my coworker's like, dude, you're so positive. I'm like, dude, praise Jesus, because I don't always feel positive, right? I mean, I don't think Joseph always felt good about what he was doing. Can we just be real? I mean, how many of you guys got jobs that you really don't like? Can you raise your hand? I'll still love you. <laughs> Sometimes you got to do what you got to do in order to be able to do what you want to do. Can you just be real? Sometimes you have to be somewhere for a little while in order to get where you want to get. If you're trusting God, he's in control of it all. The question is, what are you doing in the midst of it? And so sometimes I walk into work and, you know, my people are like, dude, I love when you're here. You're so positive and, you know what I'm saying? And I'm positive, huh? <laughs> Just got done with a 15-hour day. Coming to work like, <laughs> you know, I got these invisible, like, uh, dental floss on my eyes. <laughs> told them open, right? Stayed up, got up early, helped my wife work on a paper because she's heck awesome, right? Tired. Then I'm going to a guest. Just talk with like five guests and they want to send back their steak because it's a little too overcooked. It was like a $25 steak. There was a cow that died for that steak. And now they don't want to eat it, right? Because it's a little too overcooked. And I'm not I'm gonna be real, it's usually the Christians on Sunday, right? And nobody wants to work on Sundays because Christians come in, ah, oh, this is too big. That bread wasn't warm enough. Oh, that was mac and cheese, it wasn't enough. But dang, you heck of fake. <laughs> Sometimes I wanna say that. Like, you ain't no Christian. I just came from church, so you better eat that meat, boy. You know meat don't grow on trees? That cow had to die for you. And you're over here wanting to throw away 20 ounces of meat. You know how much that costs at the store? Beef prices are hiking, man. Shoot, want to cook, wasting my time. 
spending 30 more minutes at that table. Now someone else has to wait 30 more minutes to eat. Because you didn't, anyway, I'm positive. <laughs> they love how I'm positive. You know what I'm saying? That's stuff you got to hold in. You give it to Jesus at home. Be like, Jesus! <laughs> but when I walk in, there's something that they're like, dude, you're different. You know, and I don't always go, yes, yeah, Jesus, you feel me? <laughs> you better go to church. <laughs> go burn. <laughs> I know what you did last night. You posted on Instagram. <laughs> but they see the presence and the power of God in your life. How can you stay so positive when people are yelling at you? They're not my issues. They want to be mad? Let them be mad. I'm going to be happy. I'm living with Jesus. And I'm being great at what I do. And I'm going to walk away, and some, at 12 o'clock midnight, it's going to be the next day. And I'm going to go home, and i got an amazing wife waiting for me. And she is amazing, you know what I'm saying? So that's all i got to say about that. And so it's going to be good. They want to argue with each other at their table and pull me into it. I'll just be like, hey, good, I got you. Want a free meal? Hey, I'm school, man. Hey, baby, my day's moving on. Because the presence of God is in you. They see it. Do your bosses look at you and say, wow, you carry the presence of God. There's something that's just different in the way that you work, in your ethic, in, in your perseverance. When discouraging situations happen, you don't give up. When you're dealing with difficult people, you don't judge them and criticize them and get mad at them. When your coworkers are wilding and out because they're crazy, because they were doing what they shouldn't have been doing last night, you still okay, you patient with them, you love them, and you're encouraging to them. You think that's just practical, secular stuff? This is kingdom business, y'all. This is kingdom business. Is your organization flourishing because you're there? Can your bosses look at the day that you were hired and see their numbers climb? You ever thought about that? I do, every day. Last night we beat our numbers, 3,500. Oh, like, get that junk, get that junk. You know what I'm saying? That's how we do, Jesus. Let's keep it going. <laughs> do the projects that you work on at work, do they succeed? Now, let me talk about something for a moment because I don't want you to mix up failure with not trying. I don't want you to mix up failure with not trying because you're going to fail. Look to your neighbor and say, you're going to fail. Yeah. You're not perfect. And there's things that you're going to work on, and there's things that God's going to put before you, and there's projects, and there's going to be new things that you're going to try. Matter of fact, you should be in positions that are discomforting constantly in order for you to grow and get better. As people, we're creatures of habit, and we're creatures of comfort, and especially living in America. We want everything convenient, right, baby? That's how we roll, huh? And we want everything nice. Not her, me. <laughs> And when change happens, oh, my God, don't let your boss say they're instituting a new policy because then people are going to go crazy. Y'all ever experienced that on the workplace? <laughs> what? We got to fill out one more form? We've been filling out 10 forms for the last 10 years. One more, what's one more going to do? Relax. <laughs> we start tripping out over all these little things. But going back to it, if you're not feeling uncomfortable at times because you're not trying new things, then you're in a complacent place, and that's not where God wants you. Joseph was thrown into a place that was completely inconvenient. He was thrown into a place that was completely unfamiliar to anything that he had ever known. And he didn't sit there and be like, God, this ain't right. I did everything right, God, and you just played me. You ever thought, about that, God, thought that God played you for a moment? I'll be real. I thought that sometimes. For real, God, you just played me. That, that wasn't cool, Lord. I thought we were like this. <laughs> but sometimes you need to be uncomfortable in order to, in order to grow. Amen. Sometimes you need a change of scenery. Sometimes you need to get fired. Amen. Sometimes you've been so comfortable with what you've been doing, and you're never going to move forward, and you know in your heart you want to move forward, but you're so scared of the risk that it's gonna have, you're going to have to take, and you're so afraid of failing that you're like, nah, I'm just cool. We're just going to be coasting. And your boss needs to go, well, you know what? Here's your pink slip. Have a great life. And you need to be like, you know what? Thank you for doing that. <laughs> Even though you may not want to do that. But there's a difference between failing and a difference between not trying. 
When you move forward, you're going to trip up. When you're learning a new language, I mean, when I'm trying to speak Spanish, they're calling me gringo and bonito and all this kind of stuff. Like, dude, my skin is brown. You better back up off me, dude. You know, I'm sh <laughs> my great grandparents are from Mexico. <laughs> Try to prove myself. I'm like, whatever, dude. I'm Joseph. <laughs> but you're going to fail. You're going to trip. You're going to stumble. But that's different from you just not trying. That's different from you just saying, I'm too afraid of it, or you know what, it's not me, or you know what, I'm cool and I'm comfortable, or you know, maybe that's for somebody else, or maybe God wants to bless somebody else that way. you got to push past that failure, and you can't be afraid to move into what God has just because you might fail. Look yourself in the mirror. Tell yourself, you might fail. Matter of fact, you're probably good to fail a couple times. But you know what? God is with you, and you're going to keep on going. All you did was learn 20,000 different ways not to do it. Feel me? Look to your neighbor and say, feel me? feel me? So Joseph began to move forward. Joseph began to prosper. Joseph began to be blessed in Potiphar's house, and Potiphar's house was blessed because of him. And as he's going through this situation and everything's looking great, all of a sudden Potiphar's wife, she like, dang, that boy good. I think there's something about people named Joseph. <laughs> I think the Bible just says they're handsome. <laughs> it's biblical, right? Joseph says, right, baby? Right. <laughs> but I mean, who wouldn't try to holler at him? He rose from the pit to the palace. This boy was in a pit, and he's a go getter, he had ambition. He had a dream. He wasn't letting nothing hold him down. And you know he was a slave for a little while, so he's probably moving some heavy stuff. So that boy probably had his shirt off a couple days. You know what I'm saying? Like, yo, look at how I look when I'm showering. You know? And he's probably doing push-ups, probably doing squats. I mean, he's probably looking at his thighs. They're like, bam! Potiphar's wife was probably watching him squat and be like, mm. Never seen Hebrew before. <laughs> Hebrew. Boy, they good. But I would say she started trying to holler. Yeah. Come on, don't be so religious. It's all right. Uh, uh, this, this is how I imagine it. I don't think God's mad at me. I'm like, God, this happened, right? Okay. <laughs> so she's talking to him. She's looking at Joseph. Come to bed with me. She was straightforward. She was like, forget all the other stuff. Joseph, you good? I'm good. I'm part of his wife. You know how I do. So come on. And let me, let me set the stage for a moment. This is Potiphar's wife. She could have did the thing with Joseph. Joseph could have did the thing with her, and nobody would have ever said a word. You know why? Because she could have just had him beheaded. She, she had that much power. Her servants could have watched it. Her servants could have been in the room, and they wouldn't have said nothing because it was Potiphar's wife. She could have told Potiphar, I don't like that servant. Let's get rid of him. Boom. And Joseph understood that. He understood how powerful this woman was. But you know what? He wasn't intimidated. Some of us, were walking around our jobs, and we're so intimidated by our bosses. We're so intimidated by their position. Maybe you grew up in a position like me where, you, you know, you grew up in low-income families, and you, you never knew what it was like to have a position of power. Maybe you grew up in places where you've seen people abuse power. Maybe you grew up in positions where people that had that power oppressed others with it. And so you're intimidated by the title or position that people held. Let me share with you, Joseph was not intimidated by anyone because he knew the Lord was with him. Amen. And so when Potiphar's wife came to him and was like, Joseph, come on, let's do it. He was like, no. <laughs> Girl, you're tripping. Hold on, I'm Potiphar's wife, Joseph. You can't say no to me. Girl, I'll say no to whoever I want to. I'm a grown man. <laughs> but you know I'm going to tell Potiphar, and he will kill you. Do what you got to do. I can't sin against God. Amen. And I can't sin against Potiphar. I cannot choose to intentionally break the trust of a person who's entrusted so much to my care and betray him that way. And more than that, Put Potiphar out of the picture. One day I'm going to have to stand before Almighty God and I'm going to have to give an account of every single thing I did on my job. 
When the boss wasn't looking, account. When the office door was closed and nobody was in there and the videotape was off, I'm going to have to give an account. When I was in the bathroom and I walked into the bathroom and saw all this dirty poo on the ground and I didn't want to pick it up myself, I got to give an account for being heck of fake. I got to give an account for everything that I do, Mrs. Potiphar's wife, regardless of what you think or not. So you know what? I'm not going to do that. I refuse to allow a crack to come into my character. I refuse to compromise my integrity for a moment of pleasure or even because of fear that I might lose my life. I will walk with integrity before God in everything that I do, with every task that I'm be given, whether it seems menial or not, whether it's great or whether it's not, whether I'm given a position or not, do what you got to do, but I am not compromising here. Joseph faced public ridicule rather than choosing to compromise his integrity. And that's hard. I mean, imagine this. Potiphar's wife comes up to you, and you're talking. You know, this is the second time, and she grabs you, and she grabs your cloak, and the cloak was what they wore around. So he was probably walking out without a shirt. Might have had a robe on, nice robe, but it's Egypt. It's hot, right? Just keep it real. He's working. So she grabs his cloak, and he's like, skirt. Right? He put on his pharaohs and bounced. And he's like, I'm gone. And the Bible says that she had his cloak. So either he was running butt booty naked, or he just had a little bit of underwear, like the tidy whities on. And now he's running through Potiphar's house, either butt booty naked or with tidy whities He would have rather faced public humility from all of his co-workers and all of his peers and everyone who was under his stewardship and under his leadership. He would have rather looked, had them laughing at him and mocking him and being like, look at you, you naked freak. He would have rather had all that than to compromise his integrity. Yep. Being the oddball out sucks sometimes. It hurts. I mean, I remember, you know, as a server, I would go out and hang out with people at work. And, um, you know, they're drinking and they're doing what young adults do who don't know Jesus, right? They're doing the thing. <laughs> Do it. Just Lord bless them. Touch of Jesus, right? And I remember, though, one time that I was there and we're kicking it. We're hanging out. We're at TGI Fridays. You know, it's like 1 a.m. or 12 a.m. Well, I don't know. One of those a.m.s. And we're uh, talking. And everybody's like, come on, Joseph, man. Just, dude, just drink a little bit. Just get drunk once, dude. Come on, let's just see you get drunk. Come on, it'll be so crazy to see you get drunk. Going I'm like, shut up, shut up. All right? And they're like, uh, and I'm like, nah, man, like, just do your thing. And again, I'm not opposed to drinking, but I wasn't going to drink with them because I know what happens with them when they drink, right? And so I wasn't judging them. Where was I? I was with them. Why? Because the presence of God is in me. I'm not going to be tarnished by their presence because the power that is in me is greater than the power that's in the world. So I was establishing relationships to love on them. Now, if you can't handle that, that's okay. If you're not strong enough to be at that position, don't put yourself there. Okay, And if you're not at a place of maturity where you can, there's nothing wrong with that. God's going to build you up so you can one day. Or maybe you'll never be able to, and that's all right, too. God's going to give you other opportunities to witness in other contexts. But I was with them, and we're chilling. And you know what? In this position, when you're walking right with God, sometimes you don't even need to stick up for yourself. And I remember we're sitting there, and one dude's like, come on, dude, just do it. And one of the other guys, right, now this dude was living heck of crazy, like heck of wild. But he knew my life, and I never told them one, hey, don't do this around me, don't talk like that around me. But I just lived it with the presence of God in my life and through my work ethic and everything that I was doing. And I remember one of the guys, he was watching it, and he got up, and he's like, dude, you know he doesn't do that stuff, so why don't you leave him alone? He respects you, and he respects what you do. Why don't you respect him and respect what he does? So back up off him. And I was like, yeah, fool, back up off me. Shoot, man, I didn't got to say nothing, right? And it just made me laugh. I started laughing. But I was like, God, that's how awesome you are. My witness is spreading out because your presence is in my life. I don't even have to say nothing to people. They're looking at my life. And when someone's trying to pull me down, there may be another person over there trying to back me up who doesn't know Jesus. But the point was, don't compromise your integrity for that moment. Refuse, right, just as Joseph did. And so we see that things are going great, but all of a sudden, he gets lied on and he gets betrayed. Potiphar's wife goes to Potiphar, and as she goes to Potiphar, she tells him what happened. And as Joseph now, he's, he's put in a prison. And what seemed like a setback for Joseph was really a setup by God. 
Sometimes we think things are going well, and all of a sudden something's going wrong, and we're like, God, well, what did I do? You did nothing. You did everything right. God's just setting you up. What seemed like for Joseph, I mean, he could have questioned and he could have been like, but, but this God, but that God, but that. You know, when I, when I got the job and I started working at Texas Roadhouse and I was going through the first month of training, my sciatic nerves started kicking up. And I'm not going to lie, there's times where I'm like, God, did I do the right thing? I'm like, am I in the right place? I've been living hope for the last 10 years and I'm kind of, I'm still pastoring, but I'm not there as much. Did I like abandon my call, God? How many of you ever felt just God can take those questions? It's big enough. And I remember one day, it got so bad. Right, baby? Damn, this girl is awesome. I'm sitting there, a grown man, crying in my bed. And I text my manager, like, I can't come in today because I'm not feeling well. I didn't want to call him because I was feeling like a punk. Like, <laughs> I got call with like, a tear down. But I was sitting there in bed. I'm just crying. I'm like, babe, I can't move any direction right now. And I remember thinking, I'm texting Pastor Benjamin, all the pastors, like, you got to pray for a Mexican, y'all. Y'all got to pray. <laughs> and I remember just laying on the bed, and I'm just like, and this is literally, I had to fall asleep like this. The bed's here, and I was like this. <laughs> and my wife ran to the hospital to give me some pain meds, and I'm like, God, I know you can heal me, so please do it. I've seen you do it. And in my head, I'm just thinking, what did I do? <laughs> what did I do? Did I take the wrong step? And I was just, God said, I'm with you, Joseph. What you think is a setback is really a setup. And so Joseph gets thrown into prison. But the Bible says, as you continue to read in Genesis chapter 30, or chapter 39, 20 through 23, it says how the Lord was with Joseph in prison and everything that he did prospered. Again, a new fresh start, a new environment. And again, it could have looked like, well, God took everything away from me. Things were going uphill. It was too good to be true. See, I knew it was too good to be true. But all the time, God said, look, boy, I'm setting you up. So you got to get this, that with God, time is never wasted. Yeah. Look to your neighbor and say, time is never wasted. You see, Joseph was in the pit, but he was without a pity party. Joseph was sold into slavery without selling himself out to discouragement. He refused to moan and to cry and to wail and lay on the ground and say, God, why me? His attitude was one of that as of a victor, not of a victim. You see, the victim mentality says, well, why am I getting the promotion? Why are these people moving before me? Why is the cupbearer going back and being elevated before the king? Man, that boy forgot me. Doesn't he know I'm the one that interpreted, interpreted his dream? Okay, well, God threw me, but I'm the one that gave him that interpretation. And he was there for two more years after that. God, for real, you're forgetting me, God. What about that dream you gave me when I was a young boy and everybody was bowing down to me and I told my dad about it. It was awesome, right, God? What about that? He could have sat there and said, well, everybody else is moving up. Everybody else gets the opportunities. Everybody else gets the cool shirts and gets the cool prizes and incentives. But what about me, God? And he refused to take on that perspective. And he said, you know what? God must have put me here for a reason. So guess what? I'm about to be the best prison guard in Egypt has ever seen. They never going to never be a prison guard as good as me. And he began to elevate through his stewardship of those tasks and those positions. You see, you know, a couple nights ago, we were at work. And we were there, and um, it was just heck of garbage. <laughs> it was like midnight, and I was tired. I had worked like a 12-hour day before that. I have two busters on. And I go into the back dock where the garbage is, and there's just like 50 bags of garbage. I'm not lying. This is like restaurant garbage, right? It's not like paper. It's like blood from the fresh hand-cut steaks we got. Just come check it out, right? <laughs> right? Um, it's like just eating up food from people. It's just all this nasty, right? And I go to the kitchen manager. I'm like, look, dude, all the, the, the bins are filled, and the receptacle one with cardboard is all filled. And he's like, okay. He's like, well, you, you guys um, are going to have to empty out the cardboard one and put all that garbage in the cardboard one. And notice how he said, you guys, right? I was like, oh, you guys. <laughs> Right? And I'm like, I'm a manager, so I'm like, okay, well, I'm a manager. And I look at the busters, and I'm like, you guys got this. Right? You can do it. But then there's something in me like, dude, that's heck of shady. That's heck of shady. 
Like, how am I going to leave my busters at midnight? They're trying to go home. And they're like, both looked at me like, I didn't sign up for this. You know, like, they're like, dude, I'm done busting. I did my stuff, right? And the manager, he's like, you guys got to do it. You can't leave it out here, raccoons, all that kind of jazz or whatever, you know? I was like, all right, well, we got to do it, guys. So I went and finished my stuff, and I came back out. They're still doing there. And now my hands are dirty. I got nasty junk on my pants. I grabbed a bag. I threw it in. All of a sudden, all this juice and junk went on my face, and I'm like... All right, it's good, it's good. Give me a second. Cleaning all myself and just, and I'm like, dude, like this, you know, this, this task that, but you know what? You know, people will, will follow you when you're strong and they'll follow you in your strengths, but you know what? They're gonna connect with you in the weaknesses. They're gonna connect with you in the moments like Joseph when you're in the prison and it seemed like everything was stripped from you. It seemed like you're facing a setback, but God put you there for a reason, and he put you there for a purpose. They're going to follow you when they see you in that prison, cleaning up the grime, helping the other prisoners who've been abused by the other jailers. They're going to see you when you're in that moment picking up that trash and staying late when your boss hasn't asked you to, but you know that's what needs to get done in order to see your organization move forward. They're going to watch you when you're tired and when you're weak. They're going to watch you when you fail. They're going to see if you get back up and if you keep on grinding. They're going to watch you when stuff's going crazy in your family, but you're still showing up to work and you're being great at it because you know that the God of all creation is watching you. They're going to watch you during those moments. They're going to look at your witness during those moments when it's real, when it's raw. And in Joseph's life, he was in this prison and he refused to cry about it. He refused to wallow in disillusionment. And he said, God, I'm going to be great at this. And everybody watched him. And the prison warden watched him. And he began to elevate him. And Joseph said, this is not a setback. This is a setup. And when the time came for him to stand before Pharaoh, Joseph was not intimidated. He knew who he was. His character was intact. His integrity was immaculate. His stewardship of every task that God, not man, placed into his care. His stewardship was excellent. And when Joseph stood before Pharaoh and gave him that interpretation of the dream, and then Pharaoh elevated him to the second of command, one who at one point was not even considered equal. And when you read Genesis later, it says that Joseph was a father to Pharaoh. Somebody who wasn't even worthy to sit at the same table now was looked at as a father to the king of the country because of the power of God within him, because the stewardship that he had in his workplace. And Joseph looks at his brothers when they come before him, and I'm sure they were afraid. They're like, dude, he's going to kill us. We found out who he is. He's going to kill us. We threw this dude into a pit. He's going to hang us. It's lights out for us. Joseph looked at him and said, you know what? You intended for evil. God meant it for good. And here was the purpose, for the saving of many lives. You see, what we look at many times as discouragements and distractions and setbacks, God sees as a means of deliverance. He sees it as a means of reconciliation. And he sees it as a means of salvation for not just us, but for the generations to come behind us. Joseph saw betrayal in the natural, but God saw deliverance in the spiritual. Joseph saw trust being broken and a sense of abandonment in the natural, but what God saw was a lineage from the line of Abraham that was going to come through the preservation of all of Joseph's family. Some of you guys are looking at your jobs and your perspective needs to change. You just see this mop in your hands or you see this paperwork on your desk. And what God sees is a great commission being fulfilled and generations being brought to him. People in your workplace need you there. People in your workplace are hungering spiritually and don't even know it. Because all of creation is crying out for the sons of God to be revealed. And they're longing for you to reveal Jesus to them. And what you think was a demotion, God say no, it's a promotion in the kingdom. And we need to grab a hold of the perspective that Joseph had and say, God, how are you fulfilling salvation through all this crazy path that you're walking me on? You see broken pieces, God sees a mosaic that's beautiful. You see broken pieces, God sees progress. You're wondering how all ties together, and God says, don't even trip, I got the big picture. Keep going, keep going. The world is longing for us. The world is waiting for us. Our marketplaces that we've been placed in need us. 
They need the power that's in us, and they need the excellence that God wants to unleash in our lives. Amen. Amen. Let's just stand for a moment. I believe there's a couple of you right now that God just wants to change your perspective. I feel like there's some of you that, that God, he, did, he needs you to see that there is a reason for every season that you've been going through. He needs you to see that, like Joseph saw, you guys didn't put me here. Joseph said, God placed me here. And he needs you to see that he's placed you there for a reason. Or maybe he's getting ready to place you somewhere else. But there's a perspective change that God wants to help us to grab a hold of. And you know where this happened? This happened for me in Hong Kong. Mickey, Pastor Mickey reminded me in the office. He said, you know what? He said, dude, a year ago yesterday, yesterday, right? A year ago yesterday was when we had our first day in Hong Kong. And this is, from this trip, that trip, it began to start this journey for me. And when we were in Hong Kong, the day before I left, my wife got rejected from um, Cal State East Bay. We we're praying about what to do, and she wanted to go to school and begin an internship, and she applied, and she didn't get in. And so we're like, what the heck's going on? And she's like, babe, I don't want to work. I want to go to school. And I'm like, Jesus, what the heck's going on? We got to make this happen. And so we began to pray, and she was a little distressed. And I was a little distressed. I'm not going to lie. And at this time, I was working full-time at the church, plus working part-time at the restaurant. And I'm like, God, I can't do this that much longer. I got this for a year and a half, 60, 70 hour weeks. So I'm just like, I'm tired, God. And I went to Hong Kong and I was there. And I was, as I was in Hong Kong, Pastor Sam and the other pastors, I began to look at their lives. And I began to see that a lot of them were in business. They were at the, the top of the chain in the, business, in the banking industry and CEOs. And these were pastors who were planting churches in underground places. But God was prospering them in the marketplace. And it just began to shake me. And I was like, dang, not only is this real, but it could happen. And I began to think, well, maybe it doesn't have to happen exactly the way that I thought it should happen. I mean, I think that Joseph probably had in his mind a picture of what it was supposed to look like. And I imagine Joseph embracing his father, Israel, who he shared those dreams with probably 15, 20 years before. And Joseph saying, hey, Dad, it happened. Not, not like we thought it was, though, huh? And I imagine Israel just being there. God, it's good. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in Hong Kong, God began to radically revolutionize the way that I thought it should happen. And I said, all right, God, I'm surrendering. If I got to work five jobs, you call me to the kingdom. You call me to make Jesus' name known. However you want to do it, God, that's how I want to see it done. And that's when I came back. The day I got back, about 3 to 4 o'clock, right in that time, my wife got a call on her phone, and I saw it said, Cal State East Bay. I said, baby, you better pick this junk up. Mm. She picked up the phone. They said, Andrea, I heard them talking. It's like, you know, we got your application. They said, a spot opened up at the school, and we want to invite you to come. Boom, she got accepted. A couple days later, I was like, well, I'm going to go talk to our boss and see about management. Went in, talked to them. They're like, you know, right now there's not a spot open. But he's like, I'll find out. Literally 15 minutes later, my boss came back to me. He's like, I just talked with our regional manager. He said, a spot just opened up. If you're serious, give me your resume by midnight tonight. I was like, well, I got to check with my wife, but I'm serious, right? And I came back, and it matter, within two weeks, all the interviews were done. Went to Indonesia for two weeks on a mission trip. Came back, and training began. Eight months later, here I am. Didn't happen the way that I thought it was going to happen. But you know what? God placed me in that place for a reason. And there was a reason for every season. And there's times I question, like, well, God, what happened on the path of living hope? Wasn't it supposed to happen a different way? And God's been like, I'm with you. You just keep on moving. And I believe there's some of you right now where God needs to shake your heart and say, you just keep on moving. I need to shake your perspective for a moment. You got to see that there's a reason for this season. You got to see that I'm placing where you're at for a purpose. There's a kingdom purpose. So just lift up your hands to God. Lord, we declare that there is a release of the power of the Spirit to see, Lord God, the way that you see. You were giving us eyes to see you, God. You're giving us ears to hear you. You're giving us a heart to know what you want to do in this season of our lives. And as our sister shared this morning prophetically, Lord, that, Lord, it might be a new season. And there may be frustration. And there may be unfamiliarity. 
Lord, and there may be discomfort, but this is the season that you have destined us for. And just as every part of Joseph's journey was a part of the fulfillment of his destiny, whether it was in the pit, whether it was betrayal, whether it was the lying, or whether it was the elevation, every moment was a fulfillment of destiny. And even now, we are in a place of the fulfillment of destiny of Living Hope Christian Center. And you are placing us in the marketplace for a reason, God. And Lord, we just embrace it. And we say, yes, God. We receive what you have for us. We shake off the discouragement. We shake off the frustration. I declare, people of God, that you are empowered to witness. You are empowered to witness through your work. You are empowered to witness through the lie, through your life and through your example. And you will walk with the power of God. And the people around you will experience the presence of God and it will be tangible. God, we thank you for it, Lord. And we say yes to what you're doing in us, God. We love you. We honor you. And in the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a shout of praise. God bless you today. Hey, tomorrow's Monday fun day. You get out there and you turn the perspective of Monday in your workplace. You show up by your life and you let the presence of God radically revolutionize the marketplace.